The recording for this meeting has begun. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLink, Speed the Future, and the USAID Fall Armyworm Task Force, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Fall Armyworm Dissemination Tools from USAID. We're excited to share some tools and resources that will help development practitioners address the major issue of fall armyworm in Africa. This webinar, just so you know, is the second in a three-part series, and the recording from number one is currently posted on AgriLinks, and number three is coming up next Wednesday, focusing on pesticides. And links to those webinars are available in the little boxes to your left, and we'll also share them a few times um, in the chat box. So my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be your webinar facilitator today. So you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer session. Before we dive into the content, I'd just like to over or orient you to a few items in the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves at any point and let us know where you're joining from. We always love to see um, who's joining from what countries and what organizations. And the chat box is your main way to communicate today, and we encourage you to use it liberally to ask questions, share resources, and discuss this topic with your colleagues. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer most of them uh, in the Q&A period at the end, and also answer some in the chat box along the way. Um, you'll see that the slides are available for download in the box on the left of your screen, as well as some of the resources we'll be talking about today. And lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and some additional resources once they are ready. And they'll also be posted on AgriLinks. So I think we're ready to dive into the content today. So I will go ahead and introduce Brian Conklin, Senior Ag Advisor for the Fall Army Worm Team here at USAID. And he'll be giving an introduction to the topic and to our speakers today. Brian? Great. Thanks, Julie. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to... Uh, welcome you to the second of our three-part webinar series on the fall armyworm. And I want to thank you today for taking time to join us. And just to reiterate what Julie has already said, that all the resources you see today will be available on the AgriLinks page. And uh, we especially want to invite you to dial in to our webinar next week on pesticides. It's going to be at the same time as this. This is, like I said, part two of a three-part series. Next week will be our final uh, webinar in the series. Today we want to highlight a number of tools that we've developed to support countries in addressing the fall armyworm. Dr. Joe Husing is with us today, and he's going to walk us through some of those tools, including our IPM guide with uh, proven science-based approaches to addressing the fall armyworm, and was developed by experts from across Africa and around the world. We're also going to highlight our new pest management decision guides. These are country-specific guides that highlight a host of issues from scouting to pesticides. And then finally, we're going to debut the first of a number of new animations we're developing through our partners at Scientific Animations Without Borders, or SABO. These innovative and educational clips can be easily translated into multiple languages, and Ben Blaylock from SABO will walk us through ways to access these animations and the process that we've developed for translating these clips into local languages in your country. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Joe Husing, who's going to start us off with uh, the IPM and Pest Management Decision Guide. Sorry. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. Um, I, I wanted to first kind of outline the framework for today's discussion. Recall that um, I'm trying to here, I'll get you slides and jump in around here. There you go. Okay. Recall from the discussion last week that the doctrine for the U.S. government in addressing the fall armyworm issue in, in Africa, and really for a whole lot of pests that, that uh, are coming into, uh, into the continent, is the IPM guide. I'll talk to you just a, a little bit about that uh, in a minute in terms of how it was put together. But we're also building other pieces that you can look at as addenda or at some point will become the second edition. And so and th these materials are available for your use. We'll discuss again a little bit about uh, the technology toolbox, go into a little more depth on that today, as well as these pest management decision guides, uh, which uh, are just now being disseminated. So really the, the discussion today is around disseminating information. 
uh, and we purposefully put these tools together so that they would be easily or as easy as possible uh, disseminated, say, by TV, radio, jingles, or as Brian mentioned, uh, animation type technologies. And next slide, please. I want to remind everyone that the Pest Management Decision Guide was a group effort of global experts, African experts, U.S. experts, et cetera, uh, also from the EU and other places. Uh, and this material has been vetted. Uh, there's probably some 150 different individuals that went through and in extreme detail validating the information that's in the IPM guide. There are a lot of resources out there uh, that are available for people. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. This is the official U.S. government version of how to manage this test. Next slide, please. A couple of uh, points of homework. You can't disseminate information very well if you don't understand what the information is. And, and so I want to highlight really the first two chapters of the guide. If you're going to have a meaningful discussion with implementing partners, with people that are submitting proposals to you, or if you choose to submit a proposal, you have to understand the context. And the context is integrated pest management. We wrote the first chapter of the manual to help people understand that. Next slide, please. This, this is the first chapter here. Next slide, please. Recall that the key decision point for mitigating uh, the damage from this and other pests in maize and in other crops is the farmer. If the farmer doesn't know how to scout their field, look for damage, assess the damage, and take a decision, then essentially everything that we're talking about is moot. It all starts with the farmer. Chapter 2 outlines how a farmer would scout their field and it also leads up to the point where they may choose uh, some type of mitigation process. I, I want to remind everyone that this is a little tricky. The, the decision to implement a treatment at the farmer level is an economic decision, and it's an economic decision based on the value of that maize and the cost of the treatment. And, and please keep in mind that most of our stakeholders are smallholder farmers, it, and, and that calculus becomes very tricky for a person that's raising grain that they're going to consume, perhaps, and not sell. And that's something that we're working on right now is to try to work out those economic details. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier the pest management decision guides. These are country-specific. I'll walk through this in just a second. These are, uh, are now available online, I think, for some 11 countries. We have, we have others that are being developed right now and should be released pretty soon. And essentially, the Pest Management Decision Guide is a one-page front and back bulletin, if you will. It's very analogous to, in the U.S., what we call um, uh, extension bulletins that states put out uh, for pest control. And if you walk through this, we've got a column that helps uh, the farmer uh, understand what the insect pest looks like, the damage, et cetera, uh, maybe how to prevent it, how to scout for it. Again, the farmer has to be able to do an assessment and then take a decision on some kind of control. A lot of people are talking about using direct control, smashing the insects. Again, that's an economic decision. It, it works, but it's costly. It costs a lot of time to go through a field and, and smash insects. The last column is unique. Um, it's actually kind of two columns split here. This is, are the pesticides that are registered within each country that meet the USAID criteria. And I won't go in, in right now to what those criteria uh, are, uh, but essentially these would, be, uh, these would be pesticides, for example, that would be registered with US EPA. The, some of the key features that we had to go back and calculate are specific to smallholder farmers. These are people that may not have the best spray equipment. They probably don't have any protective equipment. And so two of the uh, cal uh, calculations that Paul's going to talk about next week are pre-harvest intervals and restricted uh, entry intervals. And these have to do with 
how soon you can go back into a field after you spray and also how uh, the, the delay time you need to have between spraying and harvesting. Next slide, please. Our technology table is being updated weekly. Uh, this is meant to be a crib sheet for you to, to consult with in a meeting or, or prior to a meeting, again, whether you're writing a proposal or reviewing proposals, for example, in which we outline on the left the integrated pest management areas. Remember, pest management is an integrated approach. There's multiple tools, and there's generally not any single right answer. There are a lot of wrong answers, but there's not always a single right answer. We try to give some assessment of efficacy. Uh, so for example, a GM crop I think most people recognize will give almost complete control, whereas other types of controls, um, some kinds of chemistries, for example, if they're not used well, may not give as good a control. We also went into some of the issues about uh, relative costs. That's a, a hard, uh, those are hard calculations to come up with, but we tried to put some idea in there. And then uh, some of the needs prior to implementation, for example, policy is a big one. Infrastructure may be important. Supply chains are a big deal in a lot of places. You know, can you even get the materials you need? Uh, and then some assessment of years to launch and scalability. Again, this will be evergreen. It will be available uh, on the uh, AgriLinks website. Next slide, please. Paul Jepson from Oregon State University, a uh, global expert in uh, pesticide risk assessment, is going to go into more detail about this next week. This is from the third chapter of the guide in which uh, we outline on the left-hand side there different active ingredients and in the number of countries where these are registered. Again, this is going to really be an evergreen document. A lot of good chemistries are being uh, registered in Africa right now or undergoing trials, some of the newer, safer materials. But essentially what we try to, do, try to do is outline highly hazardous pesticides, which please avoid, um, and then some of the different criteria that are used, for example, aquatic life mitigation. You can't spray a lot of pesticides on a lake or on a creek or in water. Wildlife, pollinators and bees, uh, bystanders and, and, and then natural enemies, for example, uh, because you, if you are lucky, you should have more than one choice in a market of uh, pesticide to use. And again, farmers, based on their skill uh, and the economics, uh, this will help guide them to the to uh, uh, the best choice for their uses. Next slide, please. Okay, this information is parked out on the AgriLinks website. I think um, April Julie uh, showed this a little earlier. If you, if you can kind of see to the right there, you'll see the pest management decision guides are, are listed on there. The, the, um, the IPM guide is going to be moved to the top. Right now I've got an arrow down, down at the bottom. It will be more prominent at the top. The French version has just released, and the Portuguese version should be available within a week. So the English, French, Portuguese, pest management decision guides are parked right there, and also those technology tables. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll turn this over to Brian now to talk to you about Salbo. Thanks, Joe. Uh, at this point, we want to debut our first Salbo animation. And let me just give you a little bit of background. Scientific Animations Without Borders has been developing these innovative animations focused on agriculture, disease, and women's empowerment. This is their first animation focused on the fall armyworm, and hopefully the first of many, with an emphasis on helping small, harm, uh, small farmers scout the fall armyworm. Uh, these animations, and I mentioned this earlier, can be easily translated into multiple languages. And we're going to walk you through that process and uh, let you know how we'll uh, can equip you in your specific country with a, an animation that's in uh, local languages relevant to your smallholder farmers. Once they're translated, they can be downloaded to farmers through multiple uh, means, and Ben Blaylock from Sabo is going to walk us through that process. We're going to highlight this process in a few minutes, but first, let's give you a preview of our first Sabo animation for fall armyworm, and then I'll introduce our next speaker. And with that, We'll give you a, a little taste of uh, our scouting animation. Maize field, and if needed, treat it with environmentally safer insecticides 
long before the maze is shoulder high. In this animation, we will explain how to scout for the fall armyworm so you can take action to protect your crop and yourself and family. Scouting means you must search through your field and check your maize plants for signs of damage from the fall armyworm. The larvae are mainly active at night, so it will be hard to find them when you scout. The larvae will cause damage to your maize. The smaller the larvae, the easier they are to control. The freshly hatched larvae are very small and hard to see. They will only be about one millimeter in length so you will need to look mainly for leaf damage. You can identify their presence as they will make pin-sized holes or So that's the first taste of uh, just a quick preview of, of what's about a three minute animation. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker, Ben Boylock from Sabo. Ben? Hey everyone, thanks Brian. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to access the animation online and then a little bit about our translation process. So you can see that this link here on the slide, um, it's on our website right now, it's live. If you go to this link, you can access the animation, you can view it, and you can download it. Um, and when this animation eventually is translated into multiple languages, uh, every language will be hosted here and it'll be easily selectable from like a drop down menu on the page um, to make sure that you know you can find whatever you're looking for. And on this page uh, we have four options available for download. One is the MP4 for computers, one is the MOV which is for broadcast and um, you know TV stations, and then we have two 3GP options which are really for smartphones and cell phones. So you can download any of these formats, you can share them, and you can pass them to anyone you'd like. They're for free use for everybody. You can pass them across your organizations and with other organizations. And we really promote um, them being used for, you know, community uh, viewing events, like on a projector and everybody gets around and learns about the technique. But really, if you're downloading this on your computer, sometimes it's kind of limited. You have to have a good internet connection and you have to uh, find a way to transfer it to your cell phone, which you know sometimes just adds an extra step. So another way to access it that we really uh, want to emphasize is the Sabo Deployer app. This is an Android app that's free for download and basically it gives you access to our whole video library. You can download it at our website at this link or really you can just go to Google Play and search for Sabo. Once you load up the app, you get access to our entire video library. So you can search through and see all the animations we have available. We have the fall army worm up there right now. Um, and you can go through the topic, language, or country for a filter. So the topics would be, you know, scouting for fall army worm or any of our other post-harvest loss animations. And also, you know, our health and women's empowerment animations. And then we have the language and country. Uh, they can help you filter through and find the video you're looking for. And so the fall armyworm is there right now, and you can go up and uh, download it to your phone. And really, this is a little bit easier than uh, downloading it to your computer and then transferring it, and you can even watch it on the app as well. And you should really be using the app because uh, it gives you another option to transfer it out in the field. Um, you do have to have Wi-Fi to download the animation, but once you download it, you can share it over Bluetooth, and you can uh, share it to somebody else that doesn't even have the app. So it helps you spread the animation when you're out in the field, you know, when there's no Wi-Fi available, um, and you can, like, pass it around to any of your colleagues or whoever it would help. So now the translation process. Um, we have it in English right now. We're working on French and Portuguese, but we are open to, uh, you know, many more languages. We want to get this in as many languages as possible. So really the only thing we have to do is identify a translator. Once we do that, um, they need to have a computer and access to the Internet, and then it would probably help for them to have a smartphone or a cell phone. But for the most part, that's about all they need. We'll send them a translation package, which will include the script, 
which is formatted for easy translation, and it'll include the instructions. Um, once they get that translation package, they are able to translate and record. And uh, translating the script is pretty simple. We've separated it into fragments, so it's easy to kind of translate at your own pace. You can, you know, translate half of it, come back later and finish the rest. Um, and then after you translate, you'll need to record the audio. And we let you do this with whatever means you have at your disposal. So if you have a computer with a microphone, that works. If you only have a smartphone, that works too. Um, we've had people use hand recorders. Basically anything that works that could record your voice, um, there's a way to do it. And we'll try and help you through that process too. Once everything's recorded and translated, uh, you can send all the files back to Sabo, which is why you know the translator will need an internet connection. Um, and once we get all the files, we'll start to overlay them on the animation. So when we're doing that process, we keep the translator involved, and we make sure that they're viewing the drafts we have, and they're approving everything. Uh, before we release anything, we want to make sure the translator is happy and that we're happy with the product and that it's accurate. Once the translation is approved, it gets put online. And at that point, it's available on our website and on our Sabo app. So anyone can access it in the same way that they're accessing the animation right now. So it's free to use, free to download, free to share, so that translator knows that you know, the work they put in, it gets to help everybody um, that would be using the animation. So uh, USAID has set up this email, fallarmyworm at usaid.gov. If you have language requests, please send it to that email. And in the coming months, we're going to be focusing a lot on translation. And also, if you want to get in touch with Sabo, uh, please contact us at this email address. Um, and you know, we, we can talk about any other uh, questions you have with Sabo. So, and I think I'm passing it back to Brian. All right, Ben, thank you very much for that. And uh, this is an exciting technology that we have, and it's available to you. Uh, ben put the uh, Fall Army Worm uh, email up there, so please feel free to send us your request for, for different languages. And as Ben was saying, this is not a, a daunting process. It's something that somebody can do in, in uh, just a couple of hours. There's a, an, an English version of it slide by slide that's been written out where somebody can write in their particular language on the opposite side, and then they basically just speak into a, an easy, rec uh, a simple recording device, and that gets sent back to the Sabo folks for translation. So we're looking forward to translating this into, into multiple languages. Obviously, we're going to have to prioritize uh, to some degree, but we do have funding to do that. So we encourage you to look for practical, pragmatic uses for this video and know that it's a tool that's out there and it's available. So uh, your partners, your civil society organizations, your uh, farm and field training groups, there are a lot of ways that we can get the word out on, on this particular animation with regard to scouting. And then we'd like you to stay tuned because we'll be developing some additional animations in the, in the future month. But thank you very much, Ben. We appreciate uh, the effort of Sabo and what you're doing on this and uh, encourage those of you who are out there to, uh, to take this tool and to use it. We also want to thank uh, Dr. Joe Husing for highlighting the uh, and for actually leading our efforts on this uh, Fall Army War manual that we've developed, the IPM guide, and now these innovative uh, pest management guides that we've developed that are country specific. So we encourage you, log on to the AgriLinks tools website. You'll see the specific pest management guides that we've developed so far. Just know that there are more coming. And yes, for those of you who are in Francophone countries, we're also developing them in French. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, thank you for taking time to join us today. That's just a short summary of some of the tools that we've developed so far. We've got plenty of time now to, uh, to sit back and to answer any questions that you may have. So I'll turn it back over to Julie. Sounds great. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> And thank you all for sharing your perspectives in the chat box. Uh, we do have time for questions on any of these guys. If there's something specific, specific that you want to know, you weren't clear on, uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. Um, let's see. And we wanted to highlight that at least for one person, the animations were not downloading. Yeah. So what should we do in that case, Brian? Well, 
with the uh, the platform that we're using, sometimes maybe you weren't able to watch the animation when we uh, when we debuted it just now, but it's very easily accessible. Ben gave you all the links to the different websites, so. Uh, also, you can go onto the AgriLinks website and you can watch it there as well. So there's a lot of ways that you can download it and watch it. We're sorry if you couldn't watch it on the webinar for some reason, the bandwidth in your particular country or where you're at, it didn't actually come through on there. But mm -hmm. uh, it's out there and available, and we encourage you to go back and watch it and let us know what you think. Yep, yeah, we're trying to put it in as many places as possible. It's also on the bottom left under the links box there. Uh, it says video right at the beginning of, of the link to, um, to that video. All right, so um, one person commented that um, you say that these documents are evergreen, which is excellent. That means that they'll be updated periodically as new information comes in. But how will we know when there are updates, and how often are, is the plan to update these documents? It's a great question, and thank you very much for asking it. I, I think we'll just, uh, I don't think we've got a mechanism right now to let you know, but obviously when we update the IPM guide, we'll, you'll see a lot of uh, announcements and press about that. It's a lot of work to, to do these updates and we'll let you know. With regard to the pest management guides right now, our major push is to get them uh, developed for as many countries as possible before we begin going back and revising and updating them. And then with regard to the Sabo animations, we'll be rolling them out as they develop. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly we'll, we'll have to have some kind of versioning control. Uh, these are the first ones out and the only ones out, so right now you're fine. But uh, it, as Brian pointed out, that's a work in progress to get the versioning control mechanism process in place. And let me mention, check your AgriLinks toolkit, which um, we've posted the link. Anything updated will be posted there immediately. And we will send periodically periodic updates to um, this group to inform you when tools are updated. That sounds good. Excellent. All right. Um, we have a question that isn't um, squarely in the purview of this webinar, but I think is still of interest and um, will certainly be relevant to the next webinar. And that's from Owen Okoko, who asked, how might we ensure that farmers are trained in the use of pesticides? especially when economic interests are the norm in many businesses. And I thought Joe could address that. So in terms of USAID funded projects, that's one of the requirements we have uh, uh, in, in terms of ensuring that all users of pesticides have been properly trained and have the proper equipment um, to use the, the, the pesticides that, they, that, they've, um, that they've chosen for this uh, mitigation. It's a big issue. There are a lot of organizations, a lot of African organizations, country level organizations that are working on this pesticide issue. It's very broad. Um, Paul Jepson is going to go into detail about this next week. Uh, part of the challenge we had in putting these recommendations together was that we had to make the assumption that probably most low resource farmers would not have access to uh, personal protective equipment. That very much limits the pesticides that, that uh, you can use if you, if you go that route. But clearly, everybody on this call has a vested interest in working with a number of organizations to ensure that farmers get the proper information and training to use these pesticides. All right, thank you, Joe. Another question from Malika Bonfor. Would it be possible to translate the tables for farmers into local languages? Malika, thanks for the, the question. I, in everything that we're doing, I think we see our, our work with Fall Army Worm as a partnership. There's a, a lot of organizations that we're partnering with, and obviously we're partnering with host country governments. And so, uh, we're doing our best to provide uh, resources for you within the, the, the scope of what we're able to do. But when it comes to something like these, you know, translating these different tables, I, that's something that you can, that we're hoping that you can easily do in your own countries. And whether you're working with your uh, local partners or your host country governments, we encourage you to use this data. We've given you good quality, science-based, uh, peer-reviewed uh, documents and approaches. and 
for many of these things, uh, we're hoping that you'll find you'll find ways to, to partner with other organizations to translate those for smallholder farmers in their own languages. With regard to the Sabo animations, we can help you with that because of the level of technicality that's required. But with regard to a lot of the tables and things that we developed, uh, there are resources for you to use, and we encourage you to find uh, innovative ways to, to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Let's see. We've had a few other questions come in. Um, let's see. One just came in from Alice uh, Nido Kantar. How do you handle the use of HHPs by farmers? Are there any alternatives? And I'm not sure what HHPs are, so perhaps the answer is pesticide. Yeah. Oh, okay. easy, easy question. Avoid, <laughs> avoid highly hazardous pesticides. They, th those should not be used by the the smallholder farmers that most of us are targeting. The, uh, those types of pesticides have a very specialized place, very limited, but they're way outside the the uh, the operational area for the for the folks that we're talking to. Um, in countries, so the way the process works is a country has to register a pesticide. They have to register it for the crop and the pest. And so part of the last year, because this is a new pest, this country's catching up on in, in that process, getting the safer material uh, labeled. Additionally, we have a pesticide working group whose one, who, one of their missions, and they're working on this very diligently with USDA, uh, FAS, is to register newer, safer pesticides if, that would be a much better fit for, uh, for smallholder farmers. And that, that work is progressing very well, and that's partly why the, the tables that we mentioned earlier are evergreen, because as those newer, better, safer materials become registered, um, we'll be able to update the, the tables to inform you that they're available. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Let's see. All right. A question came in from uh, Keith Cressman. In the pest management decision guides, would it be possible to include the possible use of the FAO FAMEWS mobile app for recording and sharing fall armyworm scouting and trap data? I'll, let me just start by, it's a great, we're grateful that FAO has their mobile app. Um, these pest management decision guides, we spent a lot of time figuring out how to get a lot of data just onto a single page. Uh, at, at this point in time, I think at least with regard to the pest management decision guides, and I'm going to refer this to Joe as well, it seems like it would be uh, difficult to add much more information than what we have on them already. Uh, this is not to, down, uh, to discount the, the value of the uh, FAO app that's been developed. But I think uh, it's great that we have multiple tools that are out there. Uh, for now, though, I think the pest management decision guides, uh, we've got a format that we're using, and our main goal is to try to get them uh, developed for as many countries as possible. And, and while I'm at that, let me uh, add to this, because this kind of combines with a question by Daniel Atwani about uh, examples of pest management decision guides for crops like sorghum and finger millet. We are actually in the process of developing these pest management guides for sorghum as well. So stay tuned for that. Great. Sounds good. Thank you, Brian. Let's see. We're pulling through some of our questions, making sure that we've gotten to them all. Um, Phil Steffen just suggested coordinating with Digital Green on um, some of the extension advisory messages in local languages, since they have done a great job in other areas of producing local language videos. And so um, I don't know if that's currently happening. Sure. But we are actually in discussions with uh, Digital Green. At this point, we haven't made any kind of, uh, I mean, we've, we've had our hands full just trying to get out the current tools that we have. Uh, so we'll stay tuned and see what happens going into the future. But there are a lot of great resources out there. For those of you who don't know what Digital Green is, Digital Green will actually go into a country and use local actors to uh, develop a video about uh, relevant topics. And so it's a great way of getting the community involved and uh, finding a solution to the particular problems that they're doing. And then, of course, the, uh, the video that they do is shot in local languages. Uh, using people that they know. So it's a great tool that are out there. I encourage you to check out Digital Green. 
Great, thank you. And I can see that Kristen Davis said that Digital Green is working on fall army worm in Ethiopia. So that's great. Excellent. Um, all right. Let's see. We had a question. Um, let's see, hold on. We're pouring through our questions, and we've still got a few more minutes to get through them. But, uh, um, Oh, no, go ahead. Real yeah. quick, um, there's a lot of information uh, around fall armyworm that's available and being developed. There are a lot of stakeholders developing a number of tools um, that are going to add significantly to, to, to battling this pest. Um, there's a being formed an R4D consortium and whose mission will be to vet all technologies, um, evidence-based, science-based, for inclusion in the information portfolio by, by a number of organizations. So this is, uh, as many know, science is a bit of a slow process. So as, tool, as tools become available, that group of scientists will evaluate them and make recommendations for their use, and as soon as that material is vetted uh, and approved, then we will be pushing that out for sure through you know through our mechanisms. Okay, great. Um, Joe, a question came in from Modibo Torre that perhaps you can add a little bit of perspective on. Can poor farmers use other low-cost techniques? to limit the diseases of fall armyworm other than pesticides. So perhaps a, a little bit more elaboration on other than pesticides, what poorer farmers should be using or how they can find out. Sure. It's an excellent question. Uh, not everyone heard the webinar last week, but the, general, the, the universally accepted process for dealing with insect pests, diseases, and weeds is integrated pest management. And the integration of pest management includes several strategies, uh, several of which are implemented even before the insect shows up in the field. These are things like agroecology, things like companion planting or uh, mixed cropping, for example. Uh, the Brazilians gave a really nice example of how they use uh, uh, silage-based systems, uh, which provided perhaps easier way in, in some ways of, of, of managing this pest. It also includes things like biological control and making sure that beneficial insects, these are little bees and wasps and ants and things like this, are encouraged in your field. The pesticide issue becomes evident when you've done all that. You've done, used your best agronomics, used your fertilizer, you've adjusted your soil pH, you've, you've used the correct planting date, to use the correct variety, and you go out in your field and, oh my gosh, I've got the pest in my field and it's causing economic damage. What do I do? That's when you go to this pesticide toolbox and you decide what are my choices and how and what is the efficacy. A big issue we have is with on-farm materials have not been vetted, they have not been validated, uh, some of them we know don't work, and we know they're not very effective, and, and in some cases may be detrimental to the crop itself. And that's what the R4D scientists uh, are working on right now. And it sounds like that's a new process, but uh, actually the stakeholders that we, that in the slide that I showed you earlier, starting back uh, in Entebbe, and this includes very much the private sector, U.S. land-grant universities, uh, CG center scientists, FAO scientists, et cetera, have vetted a lot of these. But be, be careful with homebrew remedies that people use on their farm in desperation. Many of those may not work. Many of those may be harmful. And in some cases may even harm the plant. Interesting. Thank you, Joe. I thought I'd ask you a follow-up question that just came in about pesticides from Amenti Chali, who said, how do you see the introduction of spray service providers to provide professional spraying services to control fall armyworm? For example, Feed the Future Ethiopia, uh, a USAID-funded project is partnering with CropLife Africa to do this. Yeah, excellent question. Um, 
Yeah, crop life is crop life in the private sector really stepped in very quickly. Uh, they did a couple of things. They they very much worked with us to get safer use pesticides registered. They created um, smaller packages of material that were, you know, more on the scale of what a smallholder farmer could afford and, and would use on their farms. Without a doubt, professionally trained spray service providers is a great idea. These would be individuals that would be would be trained in the use of the pesticides and would be would be trained. Uh, in, in choosing the correct pesticides, when to spray, uh, et cetera. So fa fantastic idea. Uh, and of course, I think we're all hopeful that, in, that those kinds of services will be affordable and, and be available to uh, farmers as a choice. Thank you, Joe. Excellent. And as long as we're talking about uh, the science of fall armyworm, uh, Niber Baba Pierto was wondering, are there other non-crop plants that fall armyworm can hide in when their preferred crop is not available? That is, plants in the wild um, that are not crops as hosts for the pests, and is that something farmers need to be aware of? It's a very good question. Um, the fall armyworm can feed on probably 80 different crops. Uh, entomologically, though, it probably doesn't complete development on all 80 crops. So there, there are alternative uh, hosts for this animal. Uh, but realistically, maize and the grain crops, somebody asked a question I saw earlier, sorghum, for example, millet, uh, rice, this is the, these are the, the, the crops that, that this animal uh, prefers. Uh, certainly, there, there will be recommendations made in terms of controlling grasses, for example, certain kinds of grasses around fields. Um, I, I'm not convinced that as a general statement we could make recommendations um, for farmers today in terms of alternative hosts that the, the, the fall armyworm uh, might survive on. In, in, part, in part, this is because in much of Africa, the animal is going to be endemic. It'll have multiple generations per year, and it's highly migratory. This is an animal that can can fly a thousand kilometers and find a maize field. It's it's pretty good at, at at finding maize. So, I'm not so sure that those those kinds of interventions, at least today, in my knowledge, would be very useful to us. Thank you, Joe. Let's see, we have up to 15 more minutes for questions, so uh, please keep them coming if you have any specific questions about the, um, uh, the resources, or of course we'll try and answer your general fall armyworm questions as well. Um, Regina was interested in commenting on the few questions that came in about how we update these tools. Yes, thanks everybody. Um, this is a really good question, so I think we've established that we've done our best to reach out to the, uh, to leverage the evidence base. Remember, we've managed this test successfully in the Americas for decades, and we've tried to capture that for use for smallholder farmers in Africa. And then we've pledged that we will update that IPM guide based on what many, many of you are finding in your fields in Africa. Um, so that's a given, but how do we continue to update and refresh the knowledge base, and how do we continue as a collective community to develop useful tools that clearly communicate the best information uh, based on science to our many different stakeholders. So I actually want to throw the challenge back out to all of you. I'll tell you our initial thoughts and what the U.S. government in general suggests, which is that we really, within our local communities, we analyze and understand the agriculture system so who are the actors that are naturally have a vested interest in this? So for example, we have a number of private sector partners. They're incredibly flexible at innovating new tools for response of fall armyworm. They may be doing uh, demonstrations. They may be offering extension. That is a resource that could be leveraged in your community. Um, other actors include government investments, for example, in extension or research services. So Brian mentioned earlier an important concept of building partnerships. Most countries, the 45 in Africa, and now uh, the outbreak in India, um, countries have formed national level task forces in an attempt to bring partners together 
to tailor the response for local conditions. So while we could jumpstart the process here, we will not be able to ever responsibly address, certainly not from Washington, the nuances of local context, including climate and agro, you know, the agro system. Um, so this is really now the next iteration may be up to you and your partners to think through. What are the tools you need most? What are you learning through your various on-the-ground activities? And how do you bring forward new information? Of course, wherever USAID is present, we hope to be partnering with you. We are always here in Washington to help match you to the best experts, both on the continent and also globally. So we are here to help, but I don't want to, um, we really need to look at how we facilitate a strong system in each of your local communities to continue to lead these efforts going forward. All right, thank you all. And as you can see, we've brought up some of our ending polls. Um, these are all very helpful for us to help understand whether this webinar uh, was useful to you and what you would be interested in uh, going forward. So please do let us know your responses. Um, all right, so we, um, there were a few questions about people being a little unclear about the process for getting the SABO clip into local languages. And so Brian, would you mind reiterating that? Sure. Let me start with uh, Kathy Hamlin's question asking about uh, what it is that we were asking for. And I think, Kathy, you were referring specifically to, to French and Portuguese. We, we've already decided, obviously, to translate the Sabo clip into, into major languages. So languages like French, Portuguese, uh, Swahili, and some other languages that are widely used are, are languages that, are, that we're already working on and that are on our list. And uh, in, in the case of at least French and Portuguese, we have identified translators. I think what we're also looking for is that many countries have, have local languages that where you're working with a particular group of farmers. Uh, I know for me, I was working in northern Ghana in my last posting, and there were multiple languages there. And it may be helpful to have the Sabo clip translated into, a multiple, in, into one of these local languages. So for that particular process, for something that's smaller and not a major language, we are looking for people who can translate. And if you can identify somebody through uh, one of your government partners or through one of your implementing partners that are working out in the field or somebody that you know where you've got a specific target group that you think uh, you'd like to use the Sabo clip to reach out to them, we do have that process. Ben walked us through it. And, and really the first step is to go ahead and contact us uh, and you'll see the, the email on the page that we provided for you within our notes. It's the fall armyworm uh, at usid.gov. Uh, if you'll send us your request there, at least we can use that to begin to prioritize the process. We've got some funding we can do. I think at the time we were thinking up to three languages per, per country, but it will depend obviously on the requests that come in. So once we've gotten your request and we've prioritized it, then we'll go back to you, uh, and we'll go back to the person that you've recommended for the translation process. We've got a very, very easy form for, you, for that person to follow through where each clip has a, a page with the English on one side and space for you to write out the translation on the other side. Then the person basically just reads that into a recording device. That re recording device goes back to Sabo. Sabo matches the recording to each page in the animation. And then we're going to publish that uh, recording on the Sabo site so it can be easily down, downloaded and accessible. So it's a great opportunity for you. It's, uh, we're looking to, to empower you to give you the tools that you need to work with your specific farmers. This doesn't have to be an AID project. If you're a civil society organization that's working out there, a local government partner, and you think that it would be beneficial to have this translated in a specific language, Please let us know, and we'll do everything we can to accommodate you. Great. Thank you for the clarification, Brian. That's pretty exciting. Um, all right. We are getting close to wrapping up here. We had one more question come in that is a, a pesticide-related question. Um, so we might as well toss that one out to Joe from Enzine Emiana. When is it proper to commence spraying at the farm? Is it as the plants germinate and or when the pests are noticed? It depends on your skill level. It depends on 
your, uh, say, the pesticide that you would choose to use, and it depends on the economics. Uh, so it's not an easy question to answer. What I, what I can tell you is in, in the sense of a smallholder farmer that's maybe poorly trained and doesn't have any protective equipment, what we, what we have done is two things. First, train those individuals how to assess their fields early. What we're telling farmers to do, don't rely on any other tools. You can use other tools. Don't rely on them. Get out in your field and look. Look early. Look as soon as your, material, as your seed are planted and they're germinating. You should be out in that field checking. What we are suggesting for smallholder farmers, that they not try to use any kind of treatments after the maize is roughly chest high because there's not a safe way without protective equipment for them to apply any type of pesticide. So the idea is if they're going to use some kind of mitigation that they do it early and they use the safest available material and that they consult whenever possible with an expert or somebody more knowledgeable than themselves, like an extension agent, for example, um, to help advise them. Pesticides are not bad tools. But like every powerful tool, you have to be careful how you use them. This is true if you're a homeowner, for example, trying to treat um, bugs in your, in your house, right? You, there are materials that do a very good job. But you have to know how to use them, and you have to choose them wisely. We want to we wanna thank you for joining us today. We've, we've given you a lot of tools. And I want to just go back and kind of reiterate a couple of our top line uh, messages here. And the first is using the guide. We've developed this integrated pest management guide. And uh, we want you to use it. There are a lot of groups out there. I think everybody's trying to, to react and respond to the fall armyworm. And there's pressure to put things out there for people to use. We've worked very, very hard with a number of experts. We've peer reviewed this. We've got evidence-based approaches to addressing the fall armyworm. We've got something that is approved, that's been validated, that is really a foundational document for dealing with the fall armyworm. And we'd like you to use the guide. And if there's ways that we could use the guide more effectively, if there are ways that you can help us learn how to make that a, a more manageable tool to get it to the right people in the right way, please let us know. But we put a lot of time and effort in this, and it's a, it's a great document. It's foundational, and it's uh, uh, it's a wonderful tool for you to use. So use the guide, use the guide, use the guide. And here are some examples that we often get questions about. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, ways you might consider using the guide. When you're doing your project designs, if you want to integrate a response to fall armyworm into the many things you're already, the activities you're already doing, the guide as you walk through it should give you some excellent ideas. Um, if you're meeting with partners, members of the government, um, if you're attending meetings of the task force when interventions are being designed, please reference that guide. It's important to try to build on the extensive global knowledge we have on how one manages the pest. Um, the third thing is some of you are reviewing proposals from uh, technical partners who want to assist um, with responding to fall armyworm. If you want a reference check as to whether they are current with the science, the guide has attempted to assemble the best science under an IPM framework. So those are just a few ideas. We frequently get questions. We are happy to help with all of those tasks as well. But um, just to remind you, it's an excellent double check in the field as to whether the best science is being brought forward. And if you're like me and you like things that are clear and simple, that's why we've developed these one-page country-specific pest management decision guides. Uh, these are useful tools. Uh, stay tuned because we'll be bringing a, a lot more of these online for other countries. We'll be doing them in, in local languages. But there's a lot of good resources that are out there. If there are ways that you can help us get these resources into the hands of people that need them, please let us know. And then finally, I want to thank Ben Blaylock and the whole team over at Sabo for the excellent work they've done on this first clip on scouting. Uh, we encourage you to download the clip. We encourage you to look for innovative ways to use that. And of course, if you've got ideas on translation, we uh, we probably have exhausted letting you know about that. But we're interested mm -hmm. in finding ways to use that tool effectively. 
Ben highlighted some of the ways that we can get that tool out to farmers. Um, having worked in, in countries where there are farmers that don't have access to the Internet, the great thing about that Sabo app that they've developed is once you've downloaded it onto the app, you don't need Internet access. You can transport that to a group of farmers anywhere, and they have access to see and watch the videos. So there's great ways that uh, we know you and your partners can, use, uh, can find to use those tools. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us, and I'll turn it back over to Julie. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you to our presenters for highlighting this really excellent suite of tools. We sincerely hope that they will be helpful to you in your work and hope you'll stay in touch uh, surrounding your use of these tools. Um, most importantly, I would like to thank our attendees. Thank you for tuning in and for asking your excellent questions. And I would also like to thank the uh, AgriLinks team for your always excellent support of AgriLinks webinars. Uh, for those who joined late or had any trouble with your audio or video, uh, these webinars are being recorded and will be posted on AgriLinks. You'll get an email in a week or so um, with a link to both this webinar recording and the last webinar recording. And as a reminder, do sign up for the last webinar in our series focusing on pesticides, which will be next Wednesday, uh, same time and place, as April said. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you sincerely for your participation, and have a great rest of your day.